All right, so what you're looking at here is the latest version of my better half. Um, a, well, I guess that part's arguable. But a prosthesis that um, was designed, I was born without legs, um, designed to, I guess, fill that dotted line emptiness that the doctors saw during our first meeting. This was kind of what it looked like growing up in most of Montana. Um, for all of the normality that these things, I guess, were supposed to give me, at least visually, um, in terms of logistically moving around, getting around in Montana, trying to do daily activities, not so practical. Um, you're pretty much limited to a set of crutches um, you had 30 to 35 pounds hanging off the bottom of, you know, a kid between, you know, 6 and 12. And ultimately, this was kind of the face that I had pretty much in every photo, which is just like, I am not, this is not my jam. I'm not feeling this. And oftentimes, this is about the only time you would see him when I was in other gr groups of other people. And it was kind of one of those staged normality shots. The, other, the only other time I can remember being regularly put into him was uh, when I was given dishes duty. They thought it would be great practice, my parents, to put me in my legs um, and have me do dishes. It's kind of a loophole that would normally, I think, get you bagged by child services. Um, but I was <laughs> practicing in my prosthetics. Um, so now this is, you know, the, the sort of photos that I guess would sit on a mantelpiece and, you know, make neighbors feel comfortable if they came in and knew a child was disabled. That's pretty much most of my life in Montana, running around on various levels of snow. That's immediately way steep for a guy uh, about my height. Um, and like jokes aside, like you can look at these stiff, goofy pair of stilts, which is, I mean, effectively what they were for me. I was born without legs, so I had no real sense of loss or trauma. It was just like, hmm, this is the thing that happened, you are shorter. Um, but so a bunch of old guys got together in a room, and they noticed you didn't have legs, and they were just going to put you on this thing, and you just got to deal with it. Um, that was kind of my take on, you know, early fittings and dealing with prosthetics, because when I wasn't in them, I was running around in things that had been built for me locally here, the first of which was basically just a leather butt moccasin, you know, just to keep your pants dry when you're trying to run around in the snow. And so, you know, my life was kind of a dichotomy between going out to Spokane hospitals and seeing, you know, the cutting edge of technology being applied to me when I wasn't really keen on it versus the fun that I could have with a simple shoemaker that made me a little, like, you know, a deerskin sack to put my butt in. Um, and that kind of uh, uh, diversion really continued throughout my life. Um, with every iteration, I think we went through about six sets of prosthetics before I finally became vocal enough to be like, they're just not getting used. Um, this was the last one. It currently holds keys. Sometimes we put saran wrap on the inside to create a chip dip sort of situation. <laughs> it's at table height, so it works. Because you're not going to get rid of these. It's too good of an art piece thing. So. One of the things that I've noticed, and I'm a big fan of, of TED, and one of the things that's really frustrated me um, when I've seen a lot of other speakers uh, get up and give a talk regarding prosthetic technology is it's always the cutting edge, you know, how, uh, 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 you know, how advanced they can get their, their device. I think one of the most famous ones, and many of you have probably seen this, uh, something by a guy named Dean Kamen. He created the uh, Star Wars arm. So if you've seen Star Wars and Luke Skywalker's fancy robot arm, that's basically what this thing is. Five fingers should be able to grab a pop can, squeeze a water bottle, like, you know, what a regular hand should do. Unfortunately, this costs about 100 grand, is not covered by insurance, and a lot of the users have found they don't even really enjoy it, because when you have, you know, the umpteen number of different joints, all metal, mind you, extended this far out from your center of gravity, it tends to really cause some damage to your upper shoulder extremities. So, we continue on this divergent path of, you know, simpler models that maybe look less normal are solving the logistic challenges we have much more effectively. Let's play a quick game, because we need to, you guys need to start empathizing a little bit with Legless Dude, which I know is really hard. We're not going to make you sit on the floor or anything. Um, a WHO report, uh, I think it came out in 2014, it was verified uh, or reviewed uh, in December of 2015, states that 15% of the world's uh, population is currently disabled or dealing with some sort of disability. Disability. Um, disability is also an interesting demographic in terms of people entering the demographic and rehabbing out of it. Another stat is that up to 25%, or I think almost everyone's supposed to be disabled for up to 20% of their lives. Um, that number could increase based on the lifespans increasing. Um, there's just a number of things that we don't know, all of them leading to disabilities here to stay. And it's going to affect people in a way broader range than I think most of us want to admit. And so, with that in mind, I guess, uh, uh, 
try to bear with me here when I start talking about the weird stuff I began inventing for myself. Legs aren't the only answer, people. <laughs> so this was kind of uh, at the end of my high school tenure and beginning college, I realized I needed a way to get around campus really quickly. A wheelchair wouldn't really allow me to carry books very well. The legs were hilarious at this point. Um, and so I started riding a skateboard. And I mean, just like pretty much everything I've done, even when I was in the legs trying to look normal, I got stared at. That said, though, what I noticed with the skateboard was that this thing cost about 100 bucks. This cost between 10 and 12 grand. Um, and I can go down to any shop I want, buy bearings, buy wheels, get it replaced. I can do that internationally as well. Um, this, a custom-made device like this, you're pretty much tethered to the doctor or the hospital that created it to you, now, or created it for you. Now, for something that's supposed to grant you independence, being tethered to one sole provider to create any repair on any issue you have is kind of a little antithetical to the, you know, the ideal. Um, so, during my time uh, uh, in college, I kind of started to realize that the skateboard was actually as much of a mode of, of travel and, and just basic logistics as it was attracting of attention. And so, it, it ended up taking me on this photo series where I traveled around to about 30 countries um, in various economic levels, um, demographic levels, and one of the things I realized was I'm not tremendously unique, especially in Eastern Europe, uh, Bosnia, some of the, the f former bloc countries where um, uh, almsgiving was a little bit more accepted, I saw a number of people with physical disabilities using various types of low-tech ways to get around. Um, when I worked with Travel Channel, we started to try and take that idea of how can we build something that ha you know, really helps someone's ability but do it for much cheaper uh, than a leg. So we kind of went, I guess, a little overboard by starting with a skateboard and then moving to a customized street luge and then finally having a mountain board with uh, Harley chopper bars, a two-stroke engine on the back, and a full <laughs> brake system. That might have gone a little bit against my ideals in terms of trying to keep things low-tech, but I digress. Um, one of the other things that I began doing as I you know, became, you know, left the world of, you know, the comfort of my parents getting to provide some of my medical assistance. I was pretty much on my own in, you know, my mid-late 20s now. Um, I'm realizing that, uh, you know, the financial and logistic burdens that are created in my life and a lot of other, you know, disabled people's lives that I see can't be solved by this um, for both the cost as well as its lack of adaptability. Um, and so I've actually started getting into the designing game myself, um, the first of which was trying to improve upon my old butt boot, and these are just some really low-tech sketches coupled with a couple of classes I took as a shoemaker. Trying to walk in and speak to a cobbler about why is you as a legless man want to learn how to build shoes. <laughs> you got to talk quickly because there's no, you have to like legitimize the conversation before they can kick you out. Like, no, 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 this is the thing I need to do. Um, what I found was, again, this ran me, I think, about... $350, all told with the buckle and the leather and all the, the, the work that I put into it. This was a design that I worked at uh, with a couple guys uh, in Bozeman, and the basic idea was when the sidewalk ends, you know, you can't roll the skateboard, you know, down streets forever, what do we do? A, you know, a butt boot, you're not going to be walking very quickly, so my logistical problem in this case was, how do I move fast across rugged terrain? This is where my next adventure is going to take me. And we came up with this, which was, you know, our design paradigms were based on what can we get that is standard? Like, what can we order off Amazon or go down to the local hardware store and buy. Um, so we wanted to keep our design very, very simple in terms of maintaining standardized parts. The other thing we wanted to liberate ourselves of was any sense of normality. Um, one of the biggest things that you'll notice, and this is true for a lot of people with different disabilities, is they have a different gait than you all. Um, a gait being, you know, this, your bipedal weirdness like this, and then I walk like this, right? Well, with the... Uh, with the prosthetic legs, they're trying to force an entire new you know, type of movement on me as well. I have to learn how to march like you people, which is weird and frightening. You're also tall. Um, <laughs> and so we decided, why don't we just stick with the movement patterns that you have, the center of gravity that you're used to? You know, let's get rid of all this norma normalcy nonsense and just focus on trying to make you move faster and keep this cheap. And so this was the result. Uh, we ended up getting... Uh, two sets of child, uh, I think they're called springbocking cheetah legs off of Amazon, um, and put together the whole thing um, with about four visits to the, the local hardware store and about 550 bucks. You compare that to Dean 
Jane Cayman's $100,000 uh, uh, prosthesis or even Oscar Pistorius's uh, Blade Runner legs, the guy who was qualifying for the Olympics a couple years ago. Um, those, I believe, ran about $45,000 a pop. And so I really get a little frustrated sometimes when I see you know, the human interest uh, pieces uh, uh, and a lot of the TED Talks where people take the stage and espouse the bleeding edge of technology when not only is that inaccessible for a large portion of this billion person, billion head population, um, but it also doesn't solve all the logistical needs that you actually have. I want to go back to, uh, briefly, when I talked about traveling around uh, taking pictures. I found out that uh, through meeting a number of people, as well as my work in television, you know, I've become this kind of de facto resource for people with various disabilities all around the world. And the thing it's taught me more than anything is I am not unique, which is really nice, actually. Like, ah, oh, dime a dozen. <laughs> But also, uh, uh, what's really common is questions. You know, no one really knows what to do with their individual answer and the, or with their individual problem, and it's difficult to uh, uh, simply push someone in the direction of a medical world, I guess, that you know, doesn't economically cater to a lot of these folks. So, what I've been privy to see is a number of adaptations other people have created. Jian, down in the lower right, is a little girl from China, also born without legs. Um, that's a basketball. Actually, better use of, of uh, I bet a basketball might have worked better than deerskin, which is what we used when I was little. Abe Bonnefeld, up on the top, was a man who lost his legs, uh, I think quite young, but he was a Civil War messenger who built his own butt boot in the 1880s. So to find out that not only are you not unique, but some dude from the Civil War was making your stuff before you had the idea um, is really, really exciting. Let's get away from the legs thing and the limbs thing for a second, though, because that I am obviously within this immediate crowd fairly unique. Um, let's talk about spectacles, your goofy, disabled eyes. How many people have spectacles? Okay. Fair enough. Um, they were originally credited, uh, no one knows the original inventor of the spectacle, but it was credited to Alessandro de Spina in uh, 1313. Really up until the 1960s, it was seen as a sign of infirmity. You know, the way people take out spectacles at the opera? Not necessarily just to be flashy and have a cool set of binoculars. It was actually because people didn't want to wear them all day. You try to hide that as much as humanly possible. Um, and I, you know, I remember looking at photos in the 40s and 50s of people designing clear frames to try and you know, not showcase the fact that you might have bad eyes. And it wasn't until people started admitting to themselves that there's no such thing as a normal... There's no such thing as looking normal. They stop trying to chase the idea of spectacles being this you know, unseen you know, part of someone's disability and started to make it part of their fashion, part of who they were. And I think, ultimately, um, your ability to adapt, event, uh, invent, and overcome is a lot more important than the five fingers or toes that you may or may not have. And so I think when you uh, maybe next see your prosthesis, whether it's you know, highly inventive, uh, very low tech, or hell, even yours, from, you know, whatever that might be. Um, think about what impact it might have uh, on fashion, on other people. Just remember, practicality first. There's no sense of normal. Thank you.